dynamite. It is obvious that he hasn't seriously engaged with what went on behind the Iron Curtain. I wonder if he's ever sat as I have done with a 13-year-old East German girl who came home from school weeping. I said, what's wrong, Esther? She said, Uncle John, they've just told me at school that I cannot study anymore. Why is that? Because I will not swear allegiance to the atheistic state. She'd been the top girl in the class for every year. And she told us, and we were stunned as adults to hear a 13-year-old say to us that she said to the teacher, Sir, one day you will stand before God and answer for what you've done to me today. That side of things is left off out of the new atheist analysis. And it shows me that there's a delusion about history within atheism. And so it is very important that we learn to do what is basic to science. And it amazes me that these people who claim to be scientists don't do it. One of the first rules of scientific thought is to learn to distinguish things that differ and to put all religions into the same box. To couple the Amish with fundamentalist Islamist terrorists is to end all possibility of debate. After all, as I pointed out to Richard Dawkins and to Christopher Hitchens, they would not like me to classify them with Stalin. All I would like them to show me is the same courtesy, that they do not classify my Christianity with fanatical and dangerous religion. Richard Dawkins expresses the opinion that all religion needs to be eliminated, even moderate religion, because moderate religion leads to fanatical religion. Well, if he believes that, he ought to stop teaching even mild atheism, because that could lead to fanatical atheism. <laughs> In fact, I would suggest he might want to stop teaching Darwinism, because it was used by social Darwinists to lead to the eugenics program in the 20th century. He might even want to teach physics, because it led to the atomic bomb. But so many people think faith is a delusion, following Freud. It's in the same category as faith in Santa Claus and the Tooth Fairy. But that's very silly, ladies and gentlemen. As a child, I believed for a very short while in Santa Claus. However, I soon sussed the real situation out, although I must confess I kept my doubts about Santa's existence to myself for some time, because I also noticed there was a material advantage in keeping it that way. <laughs> But I have never heard of an adult coming to believe in Santa Claus, have you? Or the Tooth Fairy. I've known many adult people come to believe in God. So there's a great difference. But it's worth asking the question, isn't it? Why is faith in the Tooth Fairy a delusion? The answer is obvious. The Tooth Fairy doesn't exist. So faith in God certainly is a delusion if God does not exist. But what if God does exist? Then it is clearly atheism that is a delusion. So the real question to ask is this, does God exist? Now this is so important, I want to put it another way. The new atheist quotes Sigmund Freud that God is a wish fulfillment, a fictional father figure projected on the sky of our imagination and created by our desire for security. On this view, heaven is an imaginary projection of our fear of extinction and death, and religion is simply a psychological escape mechanism so that we don't have to face life as it really is. Well, of course, that's all true, provided only that God does not exist. But if God does exist, exactly the same Freudian argument will show you equally convincingly that it is atheism that is the flight from reality a projection of the desire not to have to meet God one day and give account for your life. If God does exist, then atheism can easily be seen as a psychological escape mechanism to avoid taking ultimate responsibility for one's life. And as the brilliant German psychiatrist Manfred Lutz in his recent bestseller, A Short History of the Great One, says, as to whether God exists or not, Freud can give you no help whatsoever. So the question we need to face is, does God exist? Is there evidence on which you can base your faith? 
Well, let me give you a short scientific perspective. Because what the new atheists don't seem to realize is that faith is involved in science. So if faith is delusional, so is science. After all, the goal of science is not to impose on the matter and workings of the universe our human sense of order, but to discover the universe's own intrinsic order and intelligibility. And that means that scientists have always had to believe, before they start, that the universe has an inherent order. If it didn't, scientific research would be pointless. The quantum behavior of elementary particles still presents questions that for the moment outstrip our reason, our intuition, and powers of imagination. The same is true of human consciousness. No one understands it, and there's no generally agreed theory. In this situation, for research to continue requires faith. Faith that nature's intelligibility and order will not peter out into unintelligible chaos. Though for all we know, we might have to get our minds around a level of intelligibility far higher than any we can presently grasp. Indeed, one can even say that faith in something that has not yet been proved still is, and it always has been, a prerequisite for scientific investigation. So if the new atheists think that faith is irrational and delusional, they will have to say that the science on which they pin all their hopes is also irrational. But now comes the question, where does that faith in the rational intelligibility of the universe come from? My professor of quantum physics at Cambridge, Professor Sir John Polkinghorne, says, physics is powerless to explain its faith in the rational intelligibility of the universe for the simple reason that you cannot do any physics without believing it in the first place. So how do we know, how do I know as a mathematician that my cognitive faculties give me valid information? The first obvious thing to see is that our human reason didn't create either the universe or our own powers of reason. How can it be then that what goes on in my little tiny head can give me anything like a true account of reality? Einstein was clever enough to see the problem. The only incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it is comprehensible, he said. How can it be that mathematics thought up in the human mind corresponds to the working of the universe? What original authority, what reliability has a reason? Is it an instrument deliberately designed to enable us to discover and believe the truth? Now, this is interesting because atheists deny any deliberate design by a creator, but they still believe that reason has a proper function. And they reveal their belief that this is the case by asserting that belief in the existence of God results from a misuse of reason. Obviously, if reason had no proper function, no one could be accused of misusing it. But as we've seen, many follow Freud's contention that all the apparently rational argument put forward by believers for the existence of God are driven and corrupted by a hidden subconscious wish fulfillment mechanism. Indeed, the new atheists now claim that religious belief comes about by a, quotes, evolutionary misfiring of something useful. But I thought that misfirings and mistakes in evolution were supposed to lead to extinction. This simply shows, ladies and gentlemen, that Dawkins has no Darwinian account for religious belief. The irony of the atheist position becomes very apparent as soon as we ask about the origin of our human faculty of reason. For atheists hold that the driving force of evolution, which eventually produced our human cognitive faculties, was not primarily concerned with truth at all, but with survival. And we all know what has generally happened and still happens to truth when individuals or commercial enterprises or nations motivated by what Dawkins calls their selfish genes feel themselves threatened and struggle for survival. After all, if the thoughts in my mind are just the motions of atoms in my brain, and if my brain is a mechanism that has arisen by mindless, unguided processes, why should I believe anything it tells me, including the fact that it is made of atoms? How then is it rational 
to believe in the theory that the evolution of our faculty of reason was not directed for the purpose of discovering the truth, and yet irrational to believe that it was designed and created by our Maker to enable us to understand and believe the truth. Let me emphasize as a mathematician that atheism gives me absolutely no logical justification for the conviction common to all scientists that science can be done. In fact, atheism gives me no basis for rationality at all. It is, in that sense, delusional. And it's a sad irony that the new atheists do not even see that they themselves are driven by a rational faith even as they seek to destroy rational faith. They are passionate people of faith. They believe the world is rational. They pin their faith in science, yet Richard Dawkins says, atheists have no faith. And Christopher Hitchens says, our principles are not a faith. Our beliefs are not a belief. The mind boggles, ladies and gentlemen. Who is deluded now? Atheism gives no basis, but the Bible gives us a clear and solid basis, telling us that the reason the human mind can understand, at least in part, the universe is because the same God created the mind as created the universe. And it's this conviction that lies behind the meteoric rise of science in the 16th and 17th centuries. Men became scientific, says C.S. Lewis, because they expected law in nature, and they expected law in nature because they believed in a lawgiver. That lies behind science, and it is forgotten so easily. Now, those early scientists didn't make the mistake of the new atheists and offer us the false alternative of either science or God. That's like saying it's either Henry Ford or an internal combustion. Choose between the two. You can't have both. You either explain the motor by the laws of internal combustion or you explain it in terms of Henry Ford. That is very silly. That is to confuse two levels of explanation. Explanation in terms of mechanism, the motor and laws of internal combustion, or in terms of agency, that is Henry Ford. And exactly the same thing happens. Richard Dawkins says it's either science or God. But of course you can have both. God is the agent who designed the whole universe which science attempts to describe. Now, the reason they make this mistake is because they are deluded as to the reach of science. Because the idea, ladies and gentlemen, that science can explain everything is seriously false. The Nobel Prize winner Peter Medawar said, science cannot deal with the simplest questions of a child. Why am I here? What is the meaning of my life? It cannot deal with culture, with art, with poetry, with history. Science is limited, and that's no insult to science. It simply shows that there are frontiers, and it is very important to realize it. And they make another mistake built on top of that one, and that is that everything can be reduced to physics and chemistry. In my college in Oxford, we have wonderful dinners on a Thursday night, and I was sitting at one of these dinners, and discovered I was next to a famous biochemist. And he asked me what I did. It's an Oxford question, I'm afraid. And I said, I'm a pure mathematician. Oh, he said, how dreadfully boring. <laughs> and then I said, well, I tried to make up for it by being interested in some of the really big issues of philosophy. He said, like what? Well, I said, like whether the universe is self-existent or had a creator. Oh, he said, it's far worse than I thought then. He said, listen, the bottom line is this. I'm an atheist. I'm a reductionist. I've nothing to say to you. You've nothing to say to me. We're going to have a very miserable evening. Well, that's a very good start for a dinner party, isn't it? So I did what I normally do when I panic. I smiled at him. And I said, um, no, we're going to have a fascinating evening. Because, you know, I just love reductionism. He said, do you? Yes, I said. I know at least three kinds. He said, do you? I said, you know, the two of us are scientists, so we believe in methodological reductionism. Take a big problem, split it into little problems, study the little problems, get some insight on the big problem. Yes, he said, I'll go with that. But I said, I think you're an ontological reductionist. That is, you believe that everything can be reduced to physics and chemistry. Dead right, he said. Well, I said, let's do a little experiment then with the menu on the table. 
So I picked up the menu and got him to read it. It said roast chicken. And he said, what's the problem? Well, I said, you can reduce everything to physics and chemistry. He said, absolutely. Well, I said, let's have a go at this thing here. He said, well, what's the problem? Well, I said, look at this symbol here, this R, O, A, S, T. Those are symbols, but they're semiotic. They're carrying a meaning. He said, that's right. Well, now, I said, you explain to me the way in which those symbols carry meaning in terms of the physics and chemistry of the paper and ink. And there was a short silence which was interrupted by his wife who said, get out of that if you can. <laughs> but he didn't try. He said something very remarkable. He said, you know, John, for 40 years I've gone into my laboratory in Oxford thinking it could be done. But it so obviously can't. I was stunned by the answer. He said, you need an author. And then it suddenly dawned on him that I wasn't clever enough to have thought of that argument. He said, where did you get that argument? I said, I admit it, I got it from a Nobel Prize winner. <laughs> you see, ladies and gentlemen, it's a very simple argument. Even professors, I find, can understand it. <laughs> but it's right, isn't it? The moment you see even a single letter of the alphabet, you know there's a mind behind it. Isn't it odd that we can see the 3.5 billion letters of the genetic alphabet in exactly the right order of the human genome and say chance and necessity is all there is behind it? Strikes me as a little odd. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, what we are discovering is this, that there's a battle for our minds and there are two worldviews. One worldview starts with matter energy, that's all there is, so that therefore by definition you ultimately are the product of mindless unguided processes without any ultimate meaning. The other worldview is in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God, all things were made by Him and it's those two worldviews that are at stake here. Which of them is the delusion? Which makes more sense of science and rationality? And you can possibly dimly perceive that I pin my faith on the one that starts in the beginning was the Word. <laughs> Richard Dawkins maintains that there's no point in bringing God into the picture because God is by definition more complex than the thing you're explaining, so he's no explanation at all. So I suggested to him in a debate, I pick up a 400-page book called The God Delusion. I ask what its or origination is, and I discover it's a thing called Richard Dawkins, or a person called Richard Dawkins, who's infinitely more complicated than the book. So that's no explanation at all, is it? because he's more complicated than the thing we're explaining. I think we need to do better than that, don't we? But I want finally to come to the question of another delusion, because the new atheists claim God is a pernicious delusion and a monster. They denounce religion as evil and immoral. Theirs is a moral outrage, so it must be based on some moral standard. But they claim there is no eternal base for values external to humanity. So how can their or anybody else's standards be anything but limited human conventions, ultimately meaningless products of a blind, unguided process? How can random mutations and blind selection produce any morality at all, let alone the kind of apparently invincible morality that justifies the new atheist intolerance of religion? But the new atheists are soft atheists, ladies and gentlemen. That is to say, they defend liberal freedoms without asking where they come from. 
Some atheists do know the answer to that question. The influential German thinker Jürgen Habermas says, Christianity and nothing else is the ultimate foundation of liberty, conscience, human rights and democracy, the benchmarks of Western civilization. To this day we have no other option than Christianity. We continue to nourish ourselves from this source. Everything else is postmodern chatter. That is a very significant statement. Because you see, the hard atheists like Nietzsche, Tabu, and Sartre will ask how the new atheists can rationally justify their absolute sounding commitment to timeless values without implicitly invoking God. Because they will tell you straight, you cannot have absolute values without God. Richard Dawkins admits this pretty much. He says it's pretty hard to defend absolute values on anything other than religious grounds. But it's impossible, ladies and gentlemen, to defend any morality at all on the basis of what he sells elsewhere. The universe we observe is precisely the properties we should expect. If there is at the bottom no design, no purpose, no evil, and no good, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. DNA neither knows nor cares. DNA just is, and we dance to its music. Well, if the terrorists, or Hitler, or Pol Pot, or you or I are simply dancing to our DNA, no one can blame us for anything. One Russian intellectual put it to me, we thought we could get rid of God and retain a value for man. We found we couldn't, we destroyed man as well. And Nietzsche confirmed Dostoevsky's dictum, which was the starting point of Sartre's philosophy. If God does not exist, everything is permissible. If we now add to that the new atheist maxim, if science is true, God does not exist. We get, as David Berlinski has pointed out, the chilling result, if science is true, everything is permitted. And this is beginning to be worked out in our society. Peter Singer has grasped the logical implications of atheism when he says a newborn baby has no more value than a pig, a dog, or a chimpanzee. The new atheists, ladies and gentlemen, devalue human beings. And ironically, for all their moral outrage, they deny the one thing that upholds moral values. Justice. They hold justice to be a delusion, because for millions of people, there is no justice in this life, and they will never get justice after death by definition. There is no hope. Terrorists eventually get away with it. And reason and experience tell me that this is morally absurd. And Christianity backs me up as it teaches me that death is not the end. There is to be a final judgment at which justice will be done and done fairly. The new atheists have an advertising campaign in Britain on buses with big slogans that read, there's probably no God. Now stop worrying and enjoy your life. Why is it that they associate God with worry? Is it that they fear to meet him as judge? They don't like judgment, but I can't help noticing how judgmental they are. This is very different from German neo-Marxist Max Horkheimer's thinking. He feared that there might not be a God, since there would then be no judgment and no justice. Ladies and gentlemen, Christianity teaches that justice will be done by a judge whose appointment has been confirmed by his physical resurrection from the dead, so that faith in God is based on solid historical evidence. Christianity therefore upholds the values that are written on the consciences of all human beings. And that, of course, leads to a dilemma. The problem of my human guilt on the one hand and my desire for justice on the other. I want justice, but what will justice say to me? Atheism defines the problem out of existence. It has nothing to say. And what about God? Is he really the despot they make him out to be? No, God is the creator, he is the judge, but he is love and a source of infinite grace. The central claim of Christianity is that as an expression of his love for humans, God himself became human, the word became flesh. Christ made unparalleled claims to be the truth, to be the son of God, and backed them up by a life and teaching without parallel. But his moral teaching was not his main message. Christianity is not primarily about rules and regulations, but about relationship with God. 
and Christ's stated mission was to deal with a moral chasm that separates us humans from God when we could not deal with it ourselves. This is a moral universe. And in the nature of things, evil incurs judgment. Even we have a police force in prisons. And God, precisely because he loves human beings, must deal with the evil that ravages their lives. As a scientist, ladies and gentlemen, I cannot tell you what energy is. So don't be surprised if I cannot completely explain to you the deepest mystery of our universe's history, the death and resurrection of Jesus. Yet just as we see the effect of and use energy without completely understanding it, what I observe and experience is the transformation, the peace, the hope that comes into the lives of ordinary men and women who learn to place their faith, their confidence, their trust in Christ as their Savior and God. They receive a transcendent sense of purpose that atheism does not have and a hope that atheism does not know. But we don't have to go down the atheist road, ladies and gentlemen. The atheist faith is a delusion. Thank you. I understand they were having a problem finding some accents tonight. <laughs> so I was the only true Georgian they could find. <laughs> Before we take the first question, though, I'm going to welcome back uh, Dr. Zacharias and Dr. Leggett Lennox to join me. Please. Yes, please, the first question. When I have dialogue with atheists, they usually attribute the uniformity of science or the laws of logic to be self-sustaining. If you try to use God as a universal transcendent to explain these laws, they use Occam's razor. How would you respond to that? And the second part is, do you agree with Alvin Plantinga that God is properly basic? Why or why not? So it's a kind of epistemological yes. question. John, do you want to take that just now? Well, very briefly. Occam's razor, as you probably are aware, is the notion that we, if there are many different um, explanations, we take the simplest one, which has the fewest hypotheses. And as I understand it, our questioner is asking uh, whether it is reasonable on that basis to accept God as the author of the laws of logic. Mm -hmm. Well, I would not myself think that Occam's razor is necessary. I would think the very fact, as I tried to say earlier this evening, that the universe is rationally intelligible, that that is the foundation of all science, that that points directly to God as a perception. It's very important to observe that Paul, when he's talking about these things, said that the invisible things of God and his almighty greatness are perceived in the things that are made. You go out, you don't go through a long system of logic to, to conclude that the roses are in bloom. You perceive it directly. And it seems to me that God has built us in that way in his image so that we can perceive it directly. If you like to apply Occam's razor and say it's the simplest hypothesis, of course it's the simplest hypothesis that logic and uh, description in terms of language and argumentation reflect a rational mind. That seems to me to be perfectly logical. And it fits in with what Plantinga talks about, that God is in that sense properly basic. There is a direct perception of God. And I think that's important in an evening when we've discussed a great deal of argument and reason and so on and so forth. God has not left it simply for the intellectuals to be able to get a grasp of his existence and to have a relationship with him. God has revealed himself so that the simplest or the greatest person can respond on precisely the same terms. And in that sense, I believe that belief in God is uh, properly basic. I, I assume if you're wearing the Batman shirt, you're representing the good side and not the dark knight? Or? <laughs> yeah. Okay. 
Uh, my question is largely about God being benevolent. If we assume that God exists, what evidence do we have that he is indeed benevolent? Because our, many times our actions, if they're negative, have negative consequences. I can accept this. What I question is when innocent suffering occurs. For instance, um, Atlanta is one of the largest sex trafficking uh, cities in America. Something like this was so horrendous. How can a benevolent God accept this to happen? Now, when you raise that question, I think it is the, it is the linchpin argument that anti-theists actually hold. And, that, and so, as John has said earlier on, to deny that would be to be blinded to the felt reality of what uh, this world is. You know, uh, let me just give you a, a little bit of a personal anecdote on this and then um, give you the, there's a philosophical side to it, there's an experiential side to it. Maybe let me start with the philosophical side. To raise the problem of evil, if you're a pure naturalist, is to actually invoke a category that is very hard to even justify. What does evil really mean? It doesn't mean anything other than pain and suffering. Because if God doesn't exist, sin is not a category. You know, moral absolutes are not categories. What we are really talking about is just pain and suffering and uh, all that that encompasses. This was actually the motivating factor for Gautama Buddha. The concept of Buddhism is built entirely on one word, Dukkha. When Gautama Buddha saw old age and he saw suffering and he saw death, he began to search to find an answer. He was a Hindu at that time and he felt in Hinduism the answer was not forthcoming. So he ended up with his uh, uh, Four Noble Truths and his Eightfold Path and all of that, but it's a non-theistic framework. Now, the problem I think with Buddhist philosophy in showing the emptiness only through dukkha and only through suffering is to miss a larger question. And I want you to listen to me carefully now. If meaninglessness came only from suffering, I could understand that. We also have to explain why meaninglessness, ultimately meaninglessness comes from being weary of pleasure. Think about that. Meaninglessness of an ultimate nature comes from being weary of pleasure. It was uh, Jack Higgins, the author of The Eagle Has Landed, who said, when you get to the top of the hill, you find out there's nothing there. Ted Turner from these parts made the comment that he was quite uh, disconsolate in finding out that all you do is get to the top of the mountain and found you've got a bag full of holes. Boris Becker, after he won his third Wimbledon, was still basically struggling with the ideas of suicide. Uh, one of the great uh, football players uh, who used to play for Atlanta and then uh, uh, played baseball here for Atlanta and then um, uh, Deion Sanders and then went on to play football for the Cowboys. Deion Sanders in his testimony makes the comment that the night they won the Super Bowl was the loneliest night of his life. He lay in bed saying to himself, "Is this is what it was all about. He just got on the phone, ordered himself a Lamborghini or something like that, and he got everything he ever wanted. When he found out it wasn't there, one of the greatest hockey players Canada has ever produced, whom I know now is a fellow by the name of Paul Henderson, brilliant left winger up and down that ice, and he scored the winning goal in that seven game series against Russia. And he said, when he became a national hero, that's when he realized how empty he really was on the inside. So your question has got two parts to it. Meaninglessness does come from suffering, but we often forget meaninglessness also comes from the extraordinary fulfillment of pleasure which leaves you empty. So here's my answer to you. When you say there's such a thing as evil, you must assume there's such a thing as good. When you assume that such a thing is good, you must assume that such a thing is a moral law on the basis of which to differentiate between good and evil. When you assume there's such a thing as a moral law, you must posit a moral law giver. But that's whom the anti-theists are trying to disprove and not prove. If there's no moral law giver, there's no moral law. If there's no moral law, there's no good. If there's no good, there's no evil. The question actually self-destructs. So the only...
only way then is to find your question to be bridged with what John has just said. God is a benevolent God and a merciful God. In the very act of his own son going to the cross is a revelation of the fact that sin by nature is destructive. You get into sin, it will ultimately destroy you. Pain is the symptomatic expression of that which is broken on the inside. Very close to where you and I are standing is a young girl in Georgia who happens to have a disease that only a handful of people in this world have. It is called uh, desensitization to pain with anhydrosis. What it really means is they're not able to feel pain and their, their perspiration glands do not work. They're not able to perspire. It's a very rare form of disease. She, one, of the, one of those who has it, has it in the state of Georgia. I'm trying to remember her name. Um, she's, she's about 13 or 14 years old or something now, of that age now. Her mother said their life has been agony because she feels no pain. They have to keep somebody watching her. If she touches a live stove, she doesn't know it. If she bangs her body against a, a sharp stone when she's playing some kind of sport and cuts her arm and doesn't know it, she could bleed to death. They always have to have somebody watching her so that she will be alerted if she has injured herself and she herself is desensitized to pain. The interesting thing is the mother says every night she and the family go to, pray, go to bed and pray, God, please give our daughter back the ability to feel pain before we lose her because she cannot feel it. If the physical symptoms tell us that pain is a symptom of something that's wrong, I think we need to accept it that pain in the inner man is a symptom that something is wrong between us and God. God provides for us the help, the sustenance, the strength, and in his mercy, we in America are so blessed, we're turning against God. A place like India, with so much deprivation, where religion is so rife. I give you a word, words of him and then a personal illustration and this, that's it. A woman who was born to a home where she was soon orphaned, was then adopted by another family. Her, she was born Annie Johnston, she became Annie Johnston Flint. She contracted rheumatoid arthritis, her body was bent over in pain most of her life. She spent most of her years in bed till her body was covered from head to toe with sores. When the last eyewitness saw her, she needed eight pillows to cushion the sores on her body. Cancer and blindness had taken its toll by now. Orphaned, rheumatoid arthritic, cancerous, blind, head to toe with sores. She wrote this, he giveth more grace when the burdens grow greater. He sendeth more strength when the labors increase. To added affliction, he addeth his mercy. To multiplied trials has multiplied peace. When we have exhausted our store of endurance, when our strength has failed ere the days have done, when we reach the end of our hoarded resources, our Father's full giving has only begun. His love has no limit, his grace has no measure, his power has no boundaries known unto men. For out of his infinite riches in Jesus, he giveth and giveth and giveth again. That's the benevolence. One anecdote for practical reasons. About three weeks ago, I was in Delhi. Delhi is my home city. I was walking through downtown, a place called Connaught Place, opposite a cinema called Regal Cinema. And I just bought something, my hands were full, and as I came out, I saw a man. For those of you who've seen the movie Slumdog Millionaire, you'll see these sights are not that uncommon in some places. And he lay on a contraption that somebody had made for him with four wheels. His right leg was gone, his left leg was in a cast from his hip down to his toes. He had two pads that he held onto his hands that were worn out from pushing himself. He looked so emaciated and so pitiful. And as I was walking past him, I looked at him and my heart just sank and I walked by. And I thought to myself, how can I do that? How can I do that? The problem in a setting like that is you do it for one and before you know it, there's 20, 30 surrounding you and you can't even get out of there. And I walked back and I just got on my haunches and looked down at him. I put my hand in my pocket. I took out a bill, which is a lot of money for him, but small for us. It was a 100 rupee note, which is about $2. I scrunched that 100 rupee note in my hand, looked at him and looked into his eyes and opened his palm and put it into his hand so that nobody else would see it. 
he craned over like that and he saw it was 100 rupees. He was desperately trying to grab me and he said, Khuda apko bhala kare, sahabji, which literally means revered sir, may God richly bless you. He had so little, he recognized that gift as a gift from God. Those of us who are believers are God's hands in benevolence to lighten the burden and the pains of this world. And if we don't do that, we are not being godly in our lives. One more, I think our time is getting narrow now. So yes, sir, let's hear from you. Hello, my question is about teaching faith. And at, and at my church, I visit a juvenile prison once a month. And it's the same prison I served time in in 1996. So my question was, what's the best way to teach faith to these young men who grew up in a broken environment? And they're all 18 and under. And when I'm there, I usually talk about decision making and where sin was caused and how it led us to make the choices to be locked up. So I was asking Dr. Ravi or Stuart, okay. what's the best way to teach faith in that limited time? Because we're only there for an hour and I have about 20 minutes to teach. Well, first of all, thanks for being there for us and representing, being the hands and feet in that place. Thank you very much. And we're glad for many people like you around the world who will go into the prisons and bring hope and take a message to those who most need it. Ravi, can you give a word to that? Today? Yeah, and we'll keep it brief. And uh, if there's any way we can help you with material, with either audio or video or written stuff. We have prison chaplains from all over the country, actually, who are in touch with us, for whom we supply material. I've spoken at some of them many times, but even when I'm overseas, I'll be in a prison and speak to some of them, exchange uh, ideas. One of the things that you will often find in a place like that, which you would know better than I would, is two or three characteristics in them. They really don't know whom to trust anymore. They really don't trust anyone. The ability to trust is often gone. They look upon it, the world as them against the world, that they've either been had, they've been wrong. Invariably, it's a lot of anger that has come up against somebody, even within their own families, that has resulted in the kind of a criminal path they have taken or habits they got into that ultimately destroyed their very ability to think straight. The best thing you can be to them is first to model what you teach them that they can trust you for being there. They get used to transitory lifestyles. People are not always there for them. Posted here, posted there, gone from here, gone from there. They have nothing stable with which to connect them. And so everything is trans transient. Their life they see as unanchored, un unhinged in a way. They're sort of floating on the high seas. The best advice I would give to you is to be there for them. Not necessarily always have the perfect answer for them. But if you are there for them, listen to them, put your arm around them and pray for them, they will trust in God on the basis of what they see in you, whether you are reflecting that sense of dependability. We, we, we get letters from people on death row. I get letters from people who are actually in some of the most successful careers now with life sentences. They're reading our books, they're listening to our videos, they're listening to our tapes. So the way you build faith is by being faithful and they know that you are one of, the, one of those that they can trust in. The second thing is I think help them to find great heroes. Most of those people there have never had a great hero to follow. I would introduce them to great biographies I would give them the sense of uh, uh, the knowledge of lives that have been well lived, even though they have been lived up and down, how they have ultimately triumphed. If they can get hope that even in this dark night of the soul, it's a period after which they will ultimately triumph, hope is what they're ultimately looking for. Build their reading and their listening and their watching capacity that will enable them to look to the possibility that their lives may be rescued as well. And the last thing I would say to you is this. There's a lot of restlessness in their souls, a lot of agony. Find the kind of music that they can listen to that brings a calming spirit to them. Many, many times you'll go there and you'll find them completely agitated, 
So between your life that is lived, the heroes that are provided for them, the faithfulness that you show, and that which by ministry calms their spirit, calms their soul. I think if you build a community of believers there, they'll never be able to stand alone. This kind of thing can ultimately be influential. Let me close with this illustration and then express my thanks to everyone. She may even be here in the audience. There's a woman here uh, that uh, works in a hairdressing salon and it was about four or five years ago, maybe a little longer, I was there just having my hair cut and she paused halfway through and she said, are you a Christian? I said, why do you ask? You know, I looked at my clothes and wondered if I had something on there. She said, no, I'm just asking. I said, yes, I am. She came from a Muslim background. She said, I am too. I came to know Christ some time ago. I said, how did that happen? She said, a man came into my salon here. I was cutting his hair. He could look at me through the mirror. And I was uncomfortable with it. And at one point, he says to me, you are the most unhappy person I've seen in a long while. What's going on? And she said, I broke down and cried. I didn't like what was said. I'd just gone through one of the most heartbreaking experiences of my life on that day, and my world was falling apart. Something in my look revealed to him that I was just there for my job. I was not even connecting with what I was doing. He got up from his chair, and he went to his car and came back with a CD. He said, you will probably never see me again. I'm a missionary. He's going to Switzerland. My family and I are leaving tonight. He said, I want you to listen to this CD of hymns as you're driving back home. And here's a contact for a pastor from your country from which you come. There's a church here from that part. It's from Iran, from where, this, uh, where you come. Contact him after you hear this CD. She was driving back home, tears running down her face over all that had happened that day. All of a sudden, amazing grace comes on in the CD. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. And the, and the hymn, as it began to unfold, she was parked in her dry, in the, in the parking spot of her apartment. She said, I cried and cried. I said, God, I don't know most of what is being said here, but evidently your grace is what I need to change my life. Next day, she contacted the pastor. Long story, her whole family has come to know Christ, and she is just a vibrant witness, cutting your hair, humming those hymns and asking everybody if they are a Christian, and the answer is no, the hairdressing takes a turn at all times of our hands to follow. God bless, keep doing it any way we can help. Thank you so much for coming and being part of this.